For me, it's been policy day today. I had lunch with Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State, and now I have the incredible pleasure and privilege of spending uh, an hour and a half or so with uh, Bob Rubin, former Secretary of the Treasury. Thank you for joining us. Happy uh, here. I think it's an hour, by the way. <laughs> I built a cushion just in case I was wrong about the hour. <laughs> I saw your face. Uh, I said, "Wait a minute, they didn't commit to that." Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, after a very long and distinguished career, Bob does not really need any introduction. But I can't resist to say a few words about him that uh, he probably would not want to. He's too humble to say that about himself. Um, he was born in New York City and grew up in Miami, Miami Beach specifically, in the 40s and 50s. This is before Miami became the capital of Latin America and therefore uh, became, it was, uh, it's clearly well known right now by all my Latino friends as the place that is so close to the United States that they enjoy it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good line. <laughs> uh, Bob then went on to uh, Harvard, London School of Economics, and Yale Law School. Not bad for a Miami Beach uh, boy, right? It was what it was. <laughs> Before uh, entering the political life, Bob spent more than 25 years at Goldman Sachs, where he rose to become senior partner, or co-senior partner, and co-chairman. But specifically, Bob was well known for mentoring a lot of people at Goldman. There is a long list of people that will call uh, Bob their godfather or mentor including a very long time and good friend of mine and classmate, Tom Steyer, who always talks about you and what you taught him about markets. And why doesn't he give me a percentage of his profit? <laughs> uh, uh, Bob and I may have different political views, but he, he did well uh, at Farrell. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, for many people in this room, you know, Bob is probably much more famous for what he did after Goldman Sachs. Uh, under President Clinton, Bob served as the first ever director of the National Economic Council, which Clinton created back in 1993. After two years of serving in that capacity, he became Secretary of the Treasury, a position he held for four and a half years after the difficult years of the 1970s, if you go back in time, uh, there are two periods in American economic history that are known as, as uh, incredible economic progress. And those were the Reagan years and the Clinton years. You know, those, those have been two periods of incredible success. And Bob was at the helm of the money in the Treasury during that period. Uh, well, the, the Clinton ones, not the regular ones. No, no, the Clinton, no, no, to be clear. <laughs> we, we, gotta, we gotta make sure we date it correctly. <laughs> uh, during that time, Bob played a key role in negotiating domestic budget agreements, but very specifically, resolving many international crises in Latin America, in Asia, you may remember 97, 98, and in Russia, 98, fall of 98, September of 98. Uh, when he stepped down from Treasury Secretary, President Clinton held him as, quote, the greatest Secretary of the Treasury since Alexander Hamilton. What an incredible quote. What an incredible uh, award, so to speak, of recognition of your service. Over the last 20 years, Bob has served as chairman of the foreign, of the council. I cannot even pronounce it anymore. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm having a tough time. The Council of Foreign Relations. <laughs> you know why, right? Um, he was, uh, he's, uh, was a member of the board of directors at Citigroup, 
where he mentored another longtime friend of mine, Vikram Pandit, and a member of the Harvard Corporation, which is as a, as a, as a Stanford alum, you know, will recognize it as a, as a good university of the East. Um, Certainly one of the better universities in Massachusetts. <laughs> For sure. Um, Barb also co-founded uh, Brookings Institution Economic Policy Initiative, known as the Hamilton Project. Uh, Barb, in 1980, in 2003, published a New York Times best-selling policy memoir called An Uncertain World, Tough Choices from Wall Street to Washington. He has now a book coming out next year, titled The Yellow Pad, Making Better Decisions in an Uncertain World. It's too bad it's not coming out this year, because we need it right now. But 23 may be worse, <laughs> I'm assuming. <laughs> All will not be settled by May. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of the Foreign Policy Association, we are so honored to have you with us delivering the Pete Peterson Distinguished Lecture on national security and fiscal policy. Please join me in uh, giving Bob a warm welcome to this event. Thank you. That was a kind introduction. Uh, I've had many that were, well, Newt Gingrich once introduced me in a way that <laughs> was quite, not quite different, in any event. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Pete was a very good, I'm delighted to be here. Pete was a very good friend of mine. And Pete played an important role in my life in quite a number of ways. And Pete, as you all know, was deeply committed to fiscal policy. He founded a foundation, which is now run by his son, Michael. And he wrote several books on the subject. So for me, it, it is an honor to be here, particularly an honor to be part of, a, of a, an event that honors, that honors Pete Peterson. I'm going to approach this topic a little differently than the title, and, and I think Pete would agree with, with, with my approach and also with my conclusions. To start, Pete was chairman of the Council of Foreign Relations, as you mentioned. And then when Pete stepped down, Carla and I became the co-chairs, which we stayed in that position for about 12 years, I think, something like that. And I, I continued to have an office at the Council. And one of the great events, I have also a business office at Center of Your Partners, but that's another matter. But a, a tremendous advantage of having an office at the council is that I'm engaged on a regular basis with people who are deeply involved in the kinds of geopolitical issues that you all care about and that the title of this lecture, if you want to call it a lecture, which is instead of comments rather than a lecture, I would say, any event, then these comments are addressed to. I think it's fair to say, and I've been involved in politics and markets and economic issues for over five decades now. I started with Bob Strauss in 1972. And I, I think this is probably as complicated a time as I can remember in terms of geopolitical matters. Richard Haas, who's the president of the council, and I were at a meeting this morning with a small group of people that we're involved with. And as I thought about Richard's, Richard's thoughts and thoughts all of us had, it seemed to me that it may well be that the threats to the United States, the threats to our country, geopolitically are as great today as they've ever been. Russia, Ukraine, you have our relationship with China, which is complicated, in my opinion, not being handled terribly well, but that's another and different matter, but certainly very complicated. We have Iran, which will almost surely have nuclear capabilities in the not too distant future. We have other issues in the Middle East, including Iran's hostility to to Israel, and, and so much else. And one that has worried me a great deal, at least, is the acquisition of cyber capabilities by non-state actors, which could not destroy tremendous capabilities and facilities in this country, for example, our grid. In 2010, Mike Mullen, who at that time was chairman of the Joint Ships of Staff, said the greatest, he's also, by the way, a good fly fisherman, because I've gone fly fishing with him. <laughs> But in this capacity, he was speaking as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said he thought that while there were 30, and this remember in 2010, that while there were very many threats that we were faced then, serious threats, that the single greatest threat 
to our country's future, geopolitically, geopolitically, was our fiscal condition. Because, and his theory of the case, which I think is right, is that we need to have strong fiscal conditions in order to meet the challenges of the kind that I mentioned a bit ago. And if we have a weak fiscal trajectory, we're also going to have inadequate resources. And if we have inadequate resources, we will not be able to meet our geopolitical challenges. And that takes us to our economy. If, if the conflict of Ukraine shows nothing else, though I think it shows many other things, one thing it shows is that it is immensely important for the United States, but also for the rest of the world, for the United States to have a strong economy, which can, in turn, provide the resources that are necessary to deal with the kinds of problems problem's the wrong word, with the kinds of conditions that Putin is creating in Ukraine. And those resources are needed for military and also for intelligence. And beyond that, as the world's largest economy, we have played a major role for a long time in providing necessary aid to impoverished parts of the world, in combating climate change more recently, and in many other issues that are of great significance and even existential to us. So it takes me back to where I was a moment ago, which is to say, Pete was right. We have enormous geopolitical challenges, and if we're going to meet them, we're going to have to have political economic strength, and, have, and the economic strength will then give us the fiscal resources that are necessary to deal with geopolitical issues. Let's turn to the economy for a moment. I have thought for a long, long time, I'm an investor, by the way, so I think about this as an investor as well as whatever other capacities I have. I, we have enormous long-term strengths. I said at the meeting I was at this morning that I would rather invest in the United States than any other country. And if you think about it, the rule of law and entrepreneurial culture, flexible labor and capital markets, vast natural resources, universities that, unlike so many other, well, quite a number of other countries with major universities, universities that work with business so that the work product of the universities gets translated into the economy, and so much else. So we should succeed. We are well positioned to succeed economically, both with respect to growth and widespread economic well-being. And let me put that in, into, into context for a moment in terms of our position in the world, because obviously today's world, the focus when you think of us as an economy and as a geopolitical force, the focus is on our greatest competitor, which is China. You go back a few years ago, and, and you all will remember this. There was a tremendous enthusiasm for investing in the so-called BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South, South, South Africa. I had a view then, and this is not hindsight, I had a view then that while China had a lot of strengths, they also had a lot of, excuse me, a lot of risks. And I think what we've seen in the last few years is the materialization of those risks with the President Xi moving away from market-based economics towards state, toward ever greater state control and the fusion of the Communist Party into the economy, and, and so much else. So I think we are well positioned, however, both absolutely and relative to our chief competitor. However, however, if we're going to realize our potential, our economic potential, we have got to meet hugely consequential economic policy challenges. And there have been clearly been some significant accomplishments, even in, even in the recent, most recent time, the last year and a half. There have been a number of uh, the CHIPS Act, for, well, you can argue about the, the merits of the CHIPS Act, but it, it is viewed by many as an accomplishment. Uh, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which really had very little to do with inflation, but a lot to do with, uh, with climate change. And, and, and the various, various other measures, including one to protect our veterans, which I think is really very important. Having said that, if you look back over the last 20 years, I would say, and obviously in the last 20 years, you can have, uh, we also had uh, the ACA, the, the Health Care Act, and so forth. But if you look back over the last 20 years, I think we have failed to meet the predominance of our challenges, immigration reform, health care, uh, K through 12 education reform, overcoming poverty, dealing with racial and, and economic and socioeconomic socio inequality effectively, and so much else. And those are the challenges that I think we're going to have to meet if we're going to realize the potential that our strengths give us. Whether we can reestablish 
the effectiveness that we need in our political system is, to me, the dispositive economic issue. And I say that as an investor as well as in all other respects. Let me divide the policy challenges into three groups. And I sort of alluded to them a little bit already. First is public investment in many areas that the private sector, well, the markets simply won't engage with, from infrastructure to basic research to providing social safety nets and so much else. Second, and some of these also involve public investment, I think of structural issues, K through 12 education reform. We don't have a trade policy today, which I think is a terrible problem. Um, immigration reform. We as a nation are enormously dependent, as all of you well know, on, on having a sensible immigration policy. We don't have one today. And then third, there was the issue that Pete devoted so much of his focus to, which is having a sound, longer-term fiscal trajectory. In 1998, the federal government of the United States balanced its budget for the first time in 30 years. And if you looked at the projections that were made then, they projected a continuation of sound fiscal conditions for a long time to come. However, shortly thereafter, we had an unpaid for Iraq war. We had 2001, 2003 tax cuts that were not paid for. And I, I'm not saying the measures that we did was right or wrong. I'm just saying they weren't paid for. We had a Medicare drug benefit, which I was very much in favor of, but it wasn't paid for. And then we had the Afghan war, again, not paid for. And you put all that together, and that changed the fiscal position of the United States. If you put numbers on where we are today, the Congressional Budget Office came out recently projecting a, uh, a debt to GDP ratio of 98%, which was down just a, a smidge from the, where it was a, a couple of years ago. But they projected that the debt to GDP ratio 10 years from now will be 110%, and that will be the highest by some measure in the history of our country. The highest previously was 1946, the year after World War II. But I think that if you take their numbers, I think they very substantially understate where we're going to be as a country. The Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, which is very highly respected, as you well know, put out two sets of fiscal scenarios recently. In one of them, they projected a debt-to-GDP ratio 10 years from now of 118 percent, and the other was 125 percent. And I think even those numbers fail to capture the full potential of what could happen when you consider the national security risks we face, the adaptation needs that we're going to have with respect to climate change, which I think are probably very substantially greater than anybody has yet, well, I shouldn't say anybody, but that are yet being generally recognized, and a whole host of other areas in which I think the, the demand on our resources are simply going to be greater than those even in the committee's estimates, and those estimates, as I said, substantially higher than the CBOs, and much higher than we've had any time in our history. I believe that our, our fiscal position, and I think General Mullen had it right, even though it was at a slightly different position at that time that he, then he made it. He, he was focused on geopolitical risks. I'm going to focus more broadly. There are the geopolitical risks, our inability to deal with our geopolitical risks. Beyond that, I think there were six, I think something like five or six other readily identifiable risks. The first is excess demand. And there's no question excess demand is contributing to inflation right now, although many other factors are as well. First, the higher interest rates. The, the focus tends to be on the Fed, but independently of the Fed, there are market interest rates and their reaction to inflation. Three, the adverse effects on business confidence, and that's a function of uncertainty about future policy and future economic conditions. And that, by the way, is what we had in 1991 and 1992, which the Deficit Reduction Program in 1993, I think, really did a great deal of demurmity. For uh, what we're having already, which is a lessened or reduced capacity for public investment, both because we have less resource and because politically, when you're in a more difficult fiscal position as we are now, it is, it, it is difficult to get the, the coalescence around public investment that we need. Five, we have had a highly resilient economy and a highly resilient society in the face of all sorts of economic and geopolitical problems. But that does depend on having sound fiscal conditions and a strong economy. And finally, there's always the risk, hopefully low probability, of a financial crisis of one sort or another. I don't think it will be in our financial institutions, by the way. Our big banks are in much better condition today 
than, than they were in, in 08, 09. But there are multiple other ways that a financial crisis could develop from the, from the fiscal conditions that we have today. Oh, I'll mention one more, and it's, it's certainly not a problem for today. But if the rest of the world became nervous about our fiscal condition, and therefore about economic policy and future conditions, you could also have a movement out of the dollar and out of treasuries and much higher interest rates very quickly. Now, we obviously have the opposite condition today. But we've had those experiences. I remember when I became Secretary of Treasury, I went to, or I'd been nominated but hadn't yet been confirmed. I went to dinner with a friend of mine who knew an enormous amount about that office. And he said, every Secretary of the Treasury faces a dollar crisis sooner or later. Well, we had a quasi-crisis when I was there. We certainly don't have one today. We have a massively strong dollar. But it could happen again. The irony about our fiscal situation is we have the ability to address this duress, with, with these conditions, without undue duress. But the longer we wait, the more severe measures will have to be. Tax revenues, on average, during periods of full employment, taxes as a percentage of GDP have been about 18.5 to 19 percent, I think more toward 18.5 percent. They're about 15 to 16 percent right, no, I'm sorry, about 16 percent right now. And I think we could easily, and I might add, at the end of the Clinton years, and as you correctly said, the Clinton years were very good years economically, the debt GDP rate, the, the taxes to GDP ratio were 20 percent. So I think there's a lot of room to move taxes up without having an adverse, I would do it progressively, but you can have that argument, but I, I would certainly do it progressively if we did it, but to do that without having adverse economic effect. Also, as you all probably know, health care costs in the United States are roughly speaking 18% of GDP. If you look around the developed world, they are, I don't think there's any country with more than 10 or 11%, with, with that health care costs be more than 10 or 11%. And that not only is a competitive problem, but it feeds the cost of our federal programs. And there's an enormous amount we could do in health care. It's something I know a little bit, of, I don't know a lot about it, but I know a little bit about it. There's a tremendous amount we could do in health care to get that debt health care to GDP ratio down. I don't think we can get it down to where other countries are because we have different social conditions. But we certainly can get it well below where we are today. And that could substantially improve our trajectory with no adverse effect on outcomes. And that takes us back to what I said before, is in my opinion, the foundational and fundamental issue for our country, for our economy, and for our national security, and that is the dysfunction of our political system and the inability of our political system to meet the challenges that we face, not tremendously well, but at least moderately well. And in the fiscal area, Pete, uh, as I said earlier, and I'll say it again, Pete was enormously focused on this inability of our, of our political system to do what was needed. He told me once that uh, Margaret Thatcher said to him that the problem with fiscal policy is that you need to take measures that cost today but have benefits down the road. And that's a very difficult thing to sell politically. So the question is, are we going to be able to get our political system to have the willingness to engage in the give and take of compromise across policy and political lines. We'll be able to get our political system to focus on facts and analysis with intellectual integrity, recognizing that politics will always be involved. And will we ultimately get a, have a political system that will have the willingness to make at least moderately difficult decisions? The heart of, of if you go back over the history of our country, the heart of our political system when it has moved forward has been this willingness to compromise, the give and, not, not, not find common ground, that's different, but actually compromise, give and take of, of, of compromise to move forward. The late Marty Feldstein, who was a wonderful man, said to me that if he as a highly conservative economist with a willingness to compromise got together with a liberal economist who was also willing to compromise, they could solve most of our fiscal problems and, beyond that, solve most of, or at least move forward on most of our economic issues. But we are certainly not in that position today. Uh, Peter Hart, who, who many of you know, did the uh, Wall Street Journal NBC polling for, for a long, long time. He's now turned the firm over to somebody else. Peter, enormously thoughtful about our political system. He said to me not long ago, he said he thought most Americans 
despite all the noise, most Americans basically want, to, want our system to work, and they want our political leaders to work with each other, including the give and take of compromise, to, make it to, to get it to work. And I, I think the midterms provide a little bit of evidence of this. If you look around what happened in the midterms, and I'm sure many of you have looked at it carefully, a lot of the extremists, the yellers, the screamers, the election deniers, but on the left and the right, ran into real trouble. And I think what happened is provide some support for, for, for Peter Hart's view that there, there's a real willingness, a real desire to work together. On the other hand, we're a long way from where we need to be in that respect. We are also a long way from where we need to be in terms of a general recognition of the importance of, of a sound fiscal trajectory. What happens now is, is we incur deficits when we need them, and I was very much in favor of the <laughs> the, 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 it was uh, $1.9 trillion, and maybe it was too large. It was too large, not maybe. It was too large. But I, was, I thought it was wise to be on the large size, given the, the instabilities that were happening at the time. I was very much in favor of that legislation. The problem is we incur deficits when we need them, but then when times are good, we continue to incur deficits. So instead, we keep ratcheting up the unsoundness of our, of our condition instead of remedying it. Um, I think the great challenge for those who recognize, and this was the challenge that Pete was focused on, the great challenge for those who recognize and understand the fiscal risk that we engage with is creating a much broader public understanding of the risks that these fiscal conditions create for us. And that is a difficult thing. I, that is a very difficult thing to accomplish. I actually have some thoughts on how that maybe could be accomplished, but it, it, it Certainly, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very difficult challenge. One hope one could have is that over time, we will get a, a set of politicians in this country who can figure out how to make fiscal responsibility politically resonant. And one who did was, was President Clinton. I mean, he, he may have been a generational talent. And you, you may have other reservations about President Clinton. I'm not making a brief for President Clinton. But he did figure out how to make fiscal responsibility politically resonant, and we need politicians, again, who can do that and who are willing to do it. As you mentioned, I have a book coming out, <laughs> May 16th. And for any, uh, sake, just think to myself, for those who would like to make sure you get a copy in the face of tremendous demand, you can give me a cash deposit <laughs> tonight. <laughs> any event, be that as it may. The, the, the book is titled The Yellow Pad, Making Better Decisions in an Uncertain World, Random House, Penguin Random House publishing it. And the underlying theory of the book, which was also of the theory of my first book 20 years ago, is that there are no certainties. And if you're going to be a sound decision maker, you need to approach decision making on a probabilistic basis. And it, it's certainly the approach that I took when I ran the arbitrage department at Goldman Sachs and everything we've done since then. When we went to President Clinton, when Larry and I went to President Clinton on the Mexican support program, we said to President Clinton, there are no guarantees this is going to work. It was a very difficult set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. But we think the probabilities are that it will, and we think if we don't do it, the yeah. probability is that it could have very serious adverse effects on the United States. And his response was interesting, because he said, look, I understand what you're saying. There are no guarantees, but you're saying this is what we should do on a probabilistic basis, and we'll do it. He, 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 he related to that. And that's what we need to do now with respect to fiscal policy. We just somehow or other get a broader understanding amongst the American people that probabilistically, the place we are in fiscally creates very substantial risks for all the reasons that I've already discussed, geopolitically, economically, and societally. And as I said earlier, so I'll say it again, if we're going to do what we need to do, our political system has to become functional again in a way that it has not in a long time. I know a lot of people, and I'm sure most of you do, who are deeply involved in the political system as elected officials or journalists or some political operators, et cetera. And they all have great concern about the future of our, of our political system. And I share those concerns. You, you have to share them as you observe what's going on. On the other hand, I have a, a more affirmative, somewhat more affirmative view of our, in fact, quite a bit of more affirmative view of what I think over time could happen. And it, in fact, if I think, I won't say it could happen. It's likely to happen. We have a dynamic society. Um, we have a highly resilient society. We have a resilient political system. 
we have gone through many very difficult conditions in our past and come back out of them. And politics can change very rapidly in America. And in the midterms, to some extent, we're evidence of this, I think. So I would say that uh, there are no guarantees, and the process could be long and messy, and maybe it won't all work. But my bet is uh, the odds are pretty good that it will work. Let me spend a moment on the current economic outlook, just because it's sort of of interest to all of us. And also, it's, it's within, the, say, the next two years. It's within the current economic outlook that we'll be dealing with the geopolitical issues that I mentioned before, and also, of course, having a presidential election, 2024, which I would say is of some significance. Um, I took a yellow pad recently, and what I did was I took my little yellow pad, and I wrote down all the factors that I thought militated toward greater inflation, and then I took all the factors that I thought militated against greater inflation. And out of this, I drew four conclusions, and every one of them may be wrong. But I'm not making a brief for the, well, I have to think they're right or I wouldn't draw these conclusions. But I also fully recognize they could be wrong. Number one, I think the inflationary pressures are going to continue to be strong. And I think they're going to carry us well into next year and probably the year after. They are abating some now. They'll probably continue to abate. But uh, I was with somebody, well, forget that, I was with somebody. I was going to cite my source, I decided I better not. But I think it is very reasonable to think that we could have core inflation, which, as you know, core inflation is the headline inflation that you read about all the time, less, less uh, energy and food. We could have core inflation of, I don't know, by the end of next year, 3% still, which is very high. Hopefully we won't, but I, that, I think that if you want to take a base case, that would be my base case. Uh, secondly, I think that Fed funds rate may have to go higher than is generally expected and that most people expect. I think they're way behind the curve, and I think by being behind the curve, they force themselves to do more than they otherwise would have had to do. So I, could, I think we could well have a higher Fed fund rate than we expect, than is generally expected. Recession. I, almost everybody I know who's involved in this world expects we will have a recession at some point. And the question, but then, they, then the, question, and the question is when, and let's just say the middle of next year it begins or something like that. But you can you know, make some other guess if you want to. But what's interesting to me is that people don't seem as worried about it as I think they, you would expect them to be. And I think the reason they're not is I think the general expectation is that if we have a recession, it will be mild and it will be short. And maybe that is the best bet. I have no idea. But I'll never forget something Paul Volcker told me about inflation, but it applies to recession, too. Paul said that once an economic cycle starts, it takes on a life, it can, uh, overstating this, it can take on a life of its own and develop its own psychology. So you could have a recessionary psychology that made a recession materially more serious than the mild and short that most people think. Hopefully not, but it could happen. I could be wrong on all this, as I said a moment ago. But one of the problems we have is if we do have a recession, we don't have the tools <laughs> that we've always had to deal with them. Because interest rates, or no, the monetary policy, you bring interest rates down, but then you're feeding the very inflation that we're consumed with, well, very focused on right now. Or you'd use fiscal policy and you'd incur additional deficits, but we've just discussed our fiscal trajectory doesn't allow us that kind of resilience. So we could have a difficult time. And that will be, that could easily spill over from 23 into 24 and well into 24 and could support economic populism on both the left and the right. And then it's that environment in which we will have the 2024 presidential election. Hopefully, everything I've, all that which I've just said will turn out to be much milder than I've suggested could, could happen. But I think what I've just suggested could happen is at least a realistic possibility. Let me mention the debt limit for one second, only because it's very much in my mind at the moment. The debt limit, as you know, it, it, it's an irrational legislative measure. But nevertheless, we have a debt limit. And 
most estimates today are that we will hit the debt limit sometime early, very early next year, but then we have all these measures to defer the date. Most of those measures, are actually, we, no, all those measures, no, most of those measures we developed when, when I was there, 1995. So anyway, the thought is it'll come, sort of come to a head in the probably, uh, probably sometime at the end of next year. And w one thing that worries me a little bit is that, it, on the one hand, it's unthinkable to default. And on the other hand, you now have a House of Representatives in which, and this is not a partisan comment, there, there are uh, extremists who were saying every day <laughs> that they want to use that leverage to do things that will be anathema to the Biden administration. Now, it may be, and that, we could get into a very difficult situation, how that'll get, I, I, I still think it's unthinkable we'll default, and so I assume, for the first time in history, I might add, and so I assume we'll figure that out, but it's a real problem. Now, we can all hope that during the period between now and the end of the year, which is the so-called lame duck period of the existing Congress, this Congress has the good sense, good sense in Congress in the same sentence, but in any event, the good, the good sense to work something out on the debt ceiling so it's solved for the next couple of years, but there's certainly no guarantees on that. If we did have a default, I think it could have substantial economic effects, adverse economic effects. The, most, the one that worries me most is not the effect on the Treasury market, but rather undermining, the, and this is what I used to say in 95 when I was arguing for then, same thing I'm arguing for now, clean debt limit, um, undermining respect for the sanctity of contracts, which is one of the fun underpinnings, if you will, of not only our economy, but it's what we argue in the emerging market world all the time. So that's kind of a brief overview, I guess, of my view of the world. And let me just conclude by saying that I think this the decision that you all made, the FPA made, to combine <laughs> fiscal policy and geopolitical events, for the reasons I've already discussed, made a lot, makes a great deal of sense. It certainly is what Pete was thinking. And hopefully the, this, this combination, <laughs> or the recognition of this combination, will over time gain traction and will result in favorable outcomes for our country. Most importantly, that we meet the economic challenges we face, of which I'd say the bedrock challenge is our fiscal trajectory. So I thank you all for having me. It's very nice to be with you. Thank you. So we'll do a, we'll do a few questions, if you don't mind, Bob. Uh, let, me, let me kick it off, and then others may want to follow. Uh, you clearly have been uh, uh, a participant and a student of markets in all your life, including... Uh, participant, I don't know about the student, student part, but anyway. Participant, yeah. risk arbitrage, you know, uh, fellow. But, no. but anyhow, uh, uh, dollar and the politicization and weaponization of the dollar and the dollar system. What's, what are your views on that, and what will that, well, what you know, will that happen? I mean, on the role of the dollar? Yeah, the, well, the, the, the use of the dollar, and, and more importantly, the, the dollar clearing system to, for the U.S. government to penalize uh, states that are not behaving yeah. according to American the, the values. Swift. Yeah. 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 I personally, probably, for the very reason you just said, would have kept away from the SWIFT system. No. But having said that, you know, the dollar's got a lot of problems. The problems of our economy, the, the, the fact that we did, which I think I would not, I'm quite sure I would not have done, interfere with the clearing system. But if, but if not the dollar where? Uh, somebody said to me today, and I think it's probably right, you, you look at all choices, life is choices. And you know, would you like to have an RMB-based system? I'm not inclined to think so. Uh, uh, the euro is a complicated situation, but the monetary policy and the fiscal policy are separate. So I, you know, I kind of think the dollar is going to. I think I think we made a, I think we probably made a mistake on the SWIFT thing. Maybe we did. Maybe we didn't. Uh, but I think that the dollar is probably going to maintain its position for a long, long time to come. Partly because I, I really do believe if we can just if we can do just somewhat better with our political system, we can have a strong economy for a long, long time. But partly because the choices are not very good. Yeah. Now we uh, 
think we have a, a mic to give to people. Please wait, if you don't mind, because we're recording this. Yeah, right on the left. Yeah, yeah it seems to me that one of the uh, destabilizing factors in our political system is the deindustrialization de of the economy caused by co companies wanting to offshore, offshore jobs to places with cheaper labor, and also the fact that the digital revolution has pr produced a lot of automation. And the concomitant of that, which is that the uh, tech companies and companies like Amazon are, take up a, a much greater share of the total economy. Uh, the, the sort, of, sort of a two-part question. Do you think this is a major problem? And if so, what should policymakers do about it? I'll give you my view, but I think it's a little different than yours. Look, trade and globalization, I think, have been of tremendous value to this country. But what we didn't do, and President Clinton used to talk about this, and then we lost control of Congress, and we, we really had a pro program that, in some measure at least, would have addressed some of this. Globalization, this is my opinion, I'm not, I mean, it's obviously a very controversial set of issues, and there are plenty of people who agree with what you were suggesting. But globalization has meant. Uh, Less, less expensive prices for producers and producers here and consumers here, more choice, one thing or another. It's also displaced people, and people have lost jobs and had wages go down. What we should have done is had a much more a robust set of programs to deal with the adverse effects of trade. And it's funny, I was talking to somebody who had been in our administration just the other day about this. We actually had a program that had we held Congress, we, we, I think we could have put in place. But anyway, no, I think globalization is good for us, for bad for us, not bad for us. Having said that, you make a, 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 another point that's a very good one. That's, there are some areas that are either geopolitically or economically strategic, which we really have to, ha which we should put on shore. What, what I am troubled about is I think that, and, and I believe that is the case, but what I'm troubled about is I think that people will use onshoring and off, the, the onshoring for strategic purposes as a pretext for protectionism, which I think is, is, is a danger to us. Look, technology is going to have displacive effects. And that is just, uh, you know, we all know tech technology has a lot of benefits, and it also has a lot of displacive effects. We don't have in our country a, a policy structure, and, you, and this is not the hardest thing in the world to do, a policy structure to deal with the disclosive, which, I'm sorry, the disruptive effects of both globalization and trade and, and technology, and, and, and we need it both in terms of enabling people to relocate in the economy, and also to make sure that we have I'd call f fair compensation. I, I don't know. How, how, probably most of you know what the Earned Income Tax Credit is. It was a it was actually Ronald Reagan's favorite social program. And it was designed to provide people with very low incomes who are working with additional income. We should be revising that in today's world so that people who are engaged in all kinds of activities that we need in our society but don't pay well, and into which many people may move because technology and globalization have, have changed the job structure in the way you've discussed it, so that these people are paid a much, I would view at least as a much fairer compensation. So there's a, there's a lot to do, but it comes back to our political system. Here, on the left here. Let me start by saying that I, uh, I've agonized over the debt for many years, and anyone that knows me would, you know, back that up. But trying to understand why nothing has been done about that, one concept that I'd like to share with you to get your feedback on that would be if I look at debt as um, a percentage of household net worth as opposed to, or relative to household net worth, as opposed to debt as a percentage of GDP, it paints a very different picture. And uh, my numbers are a little stale here, but I would say that it, I think it was in 2003, we had about $8 trillion of debt, and household net worth was about $36 trillion. And I think in 2018, so this is talking about you know, how these numbers are stale, I think the debt was at that time about 20 trillion. I think we're now at about 27. Household net worth was about 130 trillion. So if you look at the size of household net worth relative to the debt, um, the debt as a percentage of household net worth has actually shrunk. So let's 
uh, you know, wh what's the significance of that? I, you know, we, we, we've gotten used to, it's sort of a convention, we express debt as a percentage of GDP, and I think that might facilitate comparisons with other countries, but I would say that if uh, you know, the United States was a much wealthier country than China, that um, our debt, even if it was the same percentage of GDP, we would be uh, much stronger than China would be because we're a much richer country. So how does that come into uh, You know, it's an interesting point, and it's not, I must say I've never heard anybody raise this before. But, I, but, it, but I'll tell you my reaction. Yeah, no, that's very good. I don't know if your numbers are right, but that's a different matter. I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong. I, I just don't know. But, but I think the problem is I'm actually going to think about this because that's something I've not heard. Any, and really, I've been around this issue for a long time. But one problem is the federal government, an awful lot of what we need to do in our society can only be done by the federal government. I mean, you can argue about you know, some parts of that too, but there's an awful lot that you need to have the, the reach and the capacities of the federal government. And that takes resources. So the only way to be, for the federal government, if let's say your numbers are right, for the federal government to do what it needs to do to deal with whether it be Ukraine or, or poverty or whatever, would be to get a whole bunch of that net worth and move it from where it is in the household to the government. And that means higher taxes. Maybe there's congressional limitations on uh, that sort of taxation? Congressional limitations? Uh, um, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, there are. Constitutional, I'm sorry. Con like constitutional oh, restrictions. Oh, where oh, you're talking about a wealth tax? Yeah. Well, I'm not talking about a wealth tax. I don't know. Well, when I, when I present this in a balance sheet perspective instead of as a percent of GDP, of GDP how would you tap into that wealth, right? Oh, I'd, oh, I'd have, I'd have, oh, I'd have higher progressive income taxes. I would have higher capital gains taxes. I think stepped up basis of death is, I've never understood the rationale behind it. A friend of mine who's very conservative tells me I'm in favor of death taxes. Well, you know, I, I don't think of it that way. But I've never understood the depth up basis of death. Uh, so those are three, ta oh, I'd have a higher corporate rate. And I think you could do all of that. This is what I think. Others disagree and have a different view. I think you could do all of that. I would not have a wealth tax. But I think you do all of that. First of all, I don't think you could do it constitutionally, so I think you're right about that. But I would do all of that, and I think you could have I think you'd have no, I, I looked at this, again, I'm, I'm not saying I'm right, but I looked at this very carefully when Biden was messing around with his, his Build Back Better thing. I think you'd do all of that without having an adverse effect on our, on our economy. Over there in the blue sweater. Uh, yes. you know, just wait, if you don't mind, just wait for the mic. There also is an interesting question, by the way, about the distribution of that household wealth. <laughs> it's not exactly spread out evenly, I don't think. <laughs> well, I agree with your your uh, your thesis. I'm, I think the causation is important, and that is, I think that the the reason why people have a difficulty dealing with it is because we've heard so many skies falling arguments over fifty years, and they've all proven to be total BS, if I may say so. The atomic clock one minute from midnight with nuclear war, the economic things, this is going to destroy us, that. And I think it's produced a, uh, a, a jilted view. But in particular, on your numbers and the background, my recollection is that what happened in 98 was exactly indicative of this of the situation. The reason we had a surplus was because the economy and the tech sector was roiling and the capital gains influx was utterly immense. And that took us independently of any income tax issue from a deficit to a surface and was calculated to go further. And I just want to add the, for your comment that what's happened in the last year where tax revenues have gone up $850 billion in a one year period it seems to me can lead to people questioning the type of surveys you said, speculating about 110 percent, that there's a great deal more uncertainty about that issue than is indicated in those kind of uh, reports that we see. Well, tax revenues went up from the prior year because we had, the <laughs> we had a pandemic recession. So, you know, you had a recovery. You know what happened in 98? You, you're right. We had, we had Technology was producing a lot of capital gains. But, but we were also able to put in place measures that we needed, tax measures, 
And I was in the Oval Office with President Clinton. And he was talking to Trent Lott. And I said, you know, Mr. President, one thing you can't do, we can't lower capital gains taxes because it doesn't serve any economic purpose, at least in my opinion. And he said, I won't do that. And then there were a whole bunch of other things that we did that affected both public investment and, and the, uh, the fiscal position. So he said, I won't do that. I said, terrific. No, about five minutes, 10 minutes into the conversation, he puts his hand over the phone. He says, Trent says we have to lower capital gains tax. I said, Mr. President, we won't agree. We're not going to do that. He get back on the phone. He said, Trent, we'll lower capital gains taxes. <laughs> and <laughs> out of that came a compromise, which is how our system should work. But you're right. We had a tremendous boon in the, in, 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 in the, in the 90s. But we also had, remember, in, in 93, we increased personal income taxes. And we increased uh, merit collections. We increased capital gains tax. And we I know we increased the corporate rate, because I remember the fight over it. So when you got the kinds of conditions that we had in 96, 7, 8, we had a higher set of rates against which those conditions occurred. You know, the question of things not having happened, you're right about that. And one can hope they won't happen. <laughs> but we now are the highest, well, almost the, almost the highest, and we will shortly have the highest debt to GDP ratio in the history of our country. I just don't think it's a risk. So you, you might be right. Maybe they won't happen. But it's not a risk I would take when we don't have to take it. Well, I think we're going to have to. Uh, oh, I can stay here. as long as people want to stay. I don't care. Huh? You want to go on for a couple more questions? OK. Uh, lady here in the, in the black. Uh, can, you, can we get a mic here? When Rumsfeld was uh, around, he was trying to privatize um, Social Security and Medicare. And now they're talking about dismantling it again. Do you think they're trying to do this because the investment houses will get a big uh, cut of it in fees? <laughs> well, I, I would say the probability of, this, of, of, ad, of, of reducing Social, is that you're talking about Social Security and Medicare? Yeah, I would say the probability of that happening is zero. And there's not much in life that's zero. What's their motivation? What? What was their motivation? To get fees? Oh, I don't know what their motivation. No, I don't know how they would get fees. But oh, <laughs> maybe you're. I, I can't speak to their motivation. All I can tell you is that I don't think we should reduce Social Security, and we won't. It just isn't going to happen. And, and we shouldn't reduce Medicare. And I don't believe we will now. If you had a dramatically different political outcome in 2024, I still don't think it'll happen, because I think it's so unpopular with the American people. But at least until then, we're certainly safe. And I think you'd be safe after that, too. But what, what to motivate them, I don't know. We'll, we'll take his question and one other one, and then, and then we'll conclude. Yeah, go ahead. As you know, many uh, emerging economies in developing countries are facing serious debt issues. This harkens back to your time as Treasury Secretary. Do you think the current international financial architecture and the international financial institutions are set up uh, to address these problems uh, properly? And does China uh, have a role? Should we involve China more in addressing these issues? Uh, yeah, uh, on the first question, the World Bank is, is, with all due respect to the World Bank, pretty hapless these days. I think the IMF still can be effective, but not the way it was when we were there. When, when we were there, the IMF, uh, with, with Kam De Su and Stan Fisher running it, and, and the Treasury, the United States Treasury, that is, could together really get the resources we needed, and then we get bring other people in. That capacity doesn't exist anymore, but the IMF is still an effective functioning. The World Bank is, well, let us just say it is not a monument to effectiveness. China should play a major role in all this, but they don't want to. They're not part of the Paris Club, which is the private say, OK. The G20 had this thing, and I've forgotten what it was called. What? Exactly. You got it exactly right. And China doesn't want to be part of that. Uh, so they, at least so far, have been unwilling to participate in debt relief other than by virtue of 
reducing the debt when somebody gives them a, a port or something. I think it's a real problem. But you know, I think it's part of, so I think that's a real, I think you have identified a real problem. But it's also part of a bigger problem, which is our relationship with China, which I at least think we're not. Maybe, maybe China wants to be the global hegemon and there's nothing we can do about it. But I sure as hell would try a lot of other approaches before we got to that point. And, and one of the issues I would deal with is exactly this. One last question, the lady over there. There have been negative climate projections since the 1980s. I worked for the Environmental Study Cl Conference in D.C. in Congress. And um, I, I wonder about energy. The, the effect on the economy is so huge, whether we might not uh, promote energy production again in the United States and natural gas, that it might have a, a significant help on the economy to do the things that you were talking about? I'm no expert on climate change, but you mentioned Tom Steyer. <laughs> Tom ran Farallon. It was, a, it, was a, it was a hedge fund. I had investment in a hedge fund. I cared how it did. I even had a minute percentage of his carry because I was an advisor. I mean, it was so small you couldn't see it, but nevertheless. <laughs> And every time I'd call Tom about his bloody hedge fund, which where my money was, he'd want to talk about climate change. And I'd say, Tom, I don't want to talk about climate change, I want to talk about my money. <laughs> but you know something? Over time, I've changed my mind. I, I think, I don't profess expertise in climate, climate change. I spend a lot of time around people who know a lot about it. I think it could, it could destroy life on Earth as we know it. They've said that since the 80s. They've said it for long? Every time. Well, let us, let us hope and pray that they remain wrong. <laughs> uh, we're doing, the, the things that we're doing could have such a negative effect on the idea of food insecurity. Basically, well, you, you we're make talking a good, about people, people being sacrificed throughout the world on the basis of the projections of our, of our fears. So individuals are being sacrificed now for what might happen later. I mean, that, that's kind of a reality. And so we've got to be really sure that we're not continuing with projections. Well, you, you're raising a good, well, an interesting, I mean, a, a good and important point. Even Biden, who has been very focused on, on, on climate change on the one hand, is asking the oil companies to produce more. I mean, we, you know, we have a short-term issue. On the other hand, uh, and I don't profess any expertise in, in climate change. And it sounds like you do know a lot about it, which I don't. But I spend a lot of time around people who know something about it. And I at least think it's existential. And I just hope I'm wrong. Now, one, the, the holy grail, of course, the holy grail would be to develop technology that removes this stuff from the atmosphere. And if we develop it, you know, and that's what I gather. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what Bill Gates, for example, is focused on. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. You know, if, if we achieve that holy grail, I'm not talking about just carbon uh, uh, removal from smokestacks. I'm talking about actually removal from the, from the atmosphere. Then we could, we could actually get out of this without having to be restrictive. But, and I'll just speak for myself. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I've become persuaded that this is really what people say it is. But you make but you make a very good point, which an awful lot of people it, it, it isn't it isn't it, we may be saving ourselves from the long run, but it certainly has costs now, and the question is how to deal with those costs. And as you've noticed, that the less developed well, a whole bunch of the emerging market countries have said that the, the, the developed countries should pay for it. Well, when they go to Congress and ask for that money, I don't think they're going to have a lot of very. It's a terrible problem. Well, with that, uh, Bob, thank you very much again. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you here. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, and thank you all. Peace.